sure it's on. Um, okay, chapter nine, and this is really just kind of reviewing. Uh, but what I, I really want to talk about is our test of significance. So tests of significance, and so we call it hypothesis testing sometimes, but test of significance. We want to start with a claim, use that claim as truth, and then see does our sample support it or not. All right, that's essentially what we're doing. All right, so right when we start with the test of significance, um, we can start with, remember, it's just like the last time, it starts with three different realms. It could be proportions, it could be means z, or it could be means t. So, and this looks a lot like if you saw, right, or you go back and compare it to your notes that you did for confidence intervals, we did the same three structures. Proportions, means, or means. Means Z is very, very rare. I want to show you it because every once in a while it pops in there, but it's very rare. Means T, most of the time, proportions, uh, other times. Okay, so let's focus on proportions as we run this thing. So proportions, what we need to always remind ourselves is proportions are always a Z distribution. So when you go to your calculator function, you're gonna find a proportion Z. You will never find a proportions T, no such thing as that. Um, okay, so that's the first thing um, that, that we want to think about. Um, actually, let me come back up to test the significance. Test the significance, remember we used a thing called phantoms. That was our acronym that we used, phantoms. And the most important parts of phantoms are the hypotheses, the assumption checks, the test calculations, the obtaining a p-value, the making a decision, and that. So if you wanted to come up with your own little acronym, it's really HATOMS instead of phantoms. Phantoms sounds cooler, so I use it. But the P part of phantoms is important to us to be able to articulate, not necessarily have to write out, but articulate. Like, what is it truly that I'm looking for? I'm looking for the true population proportion. I'm looking for the true population mean, right? I'm looking for something. And the N is really just what we do in our calculator. Okay, so let's talk proportions real quick. Uh, proportions, uh, the hypotheses. What is the hypothesis going to look like for a proportions? Remember, you will always have a null hypothesis, and you will always say P, right? Not P hat. Always say P equals, and then you'll put a value here. And that's typically going to be given to you as some kind of statement, right? That we know the national proportion of uh, United States teams who have voted is blank. They're going to give us a number, so we're going to be able to use that number. And then we say, uh, but we suspect that here in Lake Oswego, the number is higher. Or here in Lake Oswego, the number is lower, right? That, that's going to give us the advantage for the alternative hypothesis. So we'll always write up an alternative hypothesis of P is something compared to that number. Now the something that goes in there, it could be strictly greater than, strictly less than, or not equals to. It's gonna be one of those three. It will never have an equal to symbol in it though. There's no, there's no equals to in the alternative. Your equals only comes in the null hypothesis. Right, so that's gonna be kind of the first thing that we just need to direct and be able to put out there is that is um, that part of it. Um, the assumptions, I'm actually gonna kind of bypass the assumptions right now, not spend a whole lot of time on that because we spent so much time on it on chapter eight. But I will tell you that there are three of them, right? Remember one, two, and three. So you'll just detail those out and just make sure you put your values in there when you do it. Your shape, right? Make sure that you put your shape. Check, that's n times p is greater than or equal to 10, n times one minus p greater than or equal to 10 if you wanted, if you wanted it again. Uh, but it's the same as it was in chapter eight. Those three checks are the same checks from chapter eight. All right, so that was the A, and let's talk about the T part of phantoms here. The T part will always be to draw your curve, and it's gonna be a normal curve, 
<laughs> which again, and if you're not a great artist like me, your T curves and your Z curves look the same. They look like this little mound. You'll always center your value on that claim that you used up in the P value. So let me kind of highlight that. So this will be used right here. Right, so that, that, that's how you always kind of match that up. And then let's put the actual formula here. If I'm gonna calculate Z, Z is equal to, oh, not me, I'm on the wrong one. Z is equal to P hat, that's the sample proportion, minus the P claimed value. That's gonna be this value right here, whatever that value is that was claimed there. That's gonna be the same value. Divided by, and this you can get from your formula sheet, is over P, one minus P over N. All that should be underneath that square root there. All right, so that's a lot of junk that's kind of underneath that Z value. Let me really highlight that for a minute. But do notice, look at the value that we're using here. We're using the claim P value right here in this spot. We're also gonna use it down here in the standard deviation calculation. Because the assumption is that that was true, right? Somebody said that number, so we're using it as truth, so we use it in our entire calculation here. So just know that right there. So this is what the T part of phantoms would be. It's gonna be draw the curve, shade the curve, show the Z-score. So we, we, we literally show a value finally here for that. But let me go ahead and take, now I'm not doing that stuff by hand typically. Remember in the calculator, I am gonna go find the one prop Z test. That's literally what I would be using for that entire section right there. To, I would steal all the values from the one prop Z test in my calculator. One prop Z test would get you the values there. It also gets you the O part of phantoms, which is obtain a P value. All right, that you're, again, one prop Z test will give you that. It will give you that. If you want it to, it will even draw that for you. All right, the one prop Z test really does all that work for you. Your job is just to fill it in and make it look like you did it by hand, all right? That's what I kind of say for you, those of you who are going to take the AP exam, just always fake it. Make it look like you're doing it by hand, right? Just put everything out there and then let your calculator do the work for you. Um, the M part is make a decision. Remember, making a decision is your p-value versus your alpha value. So let me give you the um, connection. If your p-value is less than alpha, then we will reject the null hypothesis, right? It's an automatic, you don't even have to think about it. Just look at the alpha level, look at p-value, if p-value is less than it, reject. If your p-value is greater than your alpha value, then we are going to fail to reject. We don't wanna use the word accept. We don't, statistically, what we're not trying to do is accept the null hypothesis. We are literally trying to reject it. And the question is, do you have enough evidence to reject it? If so, you reject it. If you don't have enough evidence to reject it, then you fail to reject it. Then you say, I can't. I can't reject that. I'm not going to accept it, but I'm not going to reject it either. And then summary is that last part. Just remember, here's the word association here. If we say reject, then in our summary, we want to use the words, we have evidence and then you'll kind of go from there and put a little context on there we have evidence to talk about the alternative if you say fail to reject up above then you're going to use kind of some words that's going to sound like we do not have evidence and then we're going to go from there right just keep talking about that So that is, and, and I tell you what, and, and I'm gonna draw this line right here because actually the M and the S is the same. It's gonna be the exact same whether you're doing proportions, 
where you're doing means, or when we get into chapter 10, or when you get in chapter 11 and 12. This, all, this will always stay the same. P-value versus alpha. Figure out the relationship. Summarize. What does that mean to us? Okay? So this is all the piece right here, this, this hat -o part, right? That's the part that kind of changes um, between the different styles here. All right? So proportions, always a Z distribution. Think through all the different phantoms pieces. All right, phantoms. All right, let's talk about means. If it's a Z, means if it's a Z. Versus means if it's a T. Right. So let me kind of put some of the different pieces. Um, means if it's a Z, obviously we're doing a Z distribution. Means if it's a T, we're doing a T distribution. Why? You're only going to do this if theta is given. If they gave you the standard deviation of the population. That's very rare to be given theta. So otherwise, you're probably going to be thinking about the standard deviation of the sample is given. If they were to give you both, do a Z, because then, then you have the theta. But most of the time, they're not going to give you theta. You're going to have to rely on the T distribution here. All right. So what are the things that are consistent? Well, the, the null hypothesis is always going to be consistent between these two, so I'm just going to kind of draw it in the middle. So what does the null hypothesis look like for means? It's going to say null hypothesis, colon, mu, because we're talking about mu, that's the mean of the population, is equal to some value. And again, they, they will have to throw a value out for you. Here's this value that we know. Alternatively, mu is something about that value. It's going to be greater than or less than or not equal to. So just like it was in proportions, it's going to use up one of the inequality signs. But it will never contain the equal sign. Same thing as proportions. All right, so then think, okay, assumptions then. So if we're doing a Z test versus a T test, right, they both have assumptions, and they're both very, very similar assumptions. This one is if N is greater than or equal to 30, central limit theorem kicks in. That's a Z test if you're doing means for Z. If you're doing a means for T, if N is greater than or equal to 30, instead of saying central limit theorem, we say T distribution is robust. Right, so slight, slight difference, and that's that little tiny bit of difference, and that's what they're kind of looking for on the AP exam. Do you realize that there is a difference between these two means distributions? And it is super tiny, and so that would kind of be your shape check. Remember, if it's less than 30, um, for a Z, they better be telling you something about the population. If it's less than 30 over here, we're typically going to be looking at a data set. We're literally going to like draw out the histogram. This is what it looks like. This is what we got. This is what we know. And then you're going to do the random check and the 10% rule. Do the random check and the 10% rule. And you'll be ready to go on that. So there's that slight little subtle difference. I thought I'd just write them out for you, right? CLT, central limit theorem, guarantees normality. If it's greater than 30 and you're doing a T distribution, we just call it robust. It's good. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about the T. That is the test calculation for each of these. Let's, let's talk about it for a Z and then for a T distribution. The T part of phantoms. If I'm doing a Z distribution, I would draw a Z curve. If I'm doing a T distribution, I would draw a T curve. And look how similar they look. I just give it like a little more room at the, at the bottom. That's about the only difference I make because the T distribution is trying to be normal, but it's not. It's got a little bit more error in each of those wings or those tails that we like to call them. Um, both of these would be centered over the actual, whatever the null hypothesis number that was given. That's where you would center these things. If it was a Z, you would center it over it. If it's a T, you would center it over it. It's whatever this value was up here. Right, that's the value that gets centered here and here. 
Okay, so here's the other little subtle difference then. Well, if the only other difference comes on if we're doing a Z calculation or if we're doing a T calculation. So if I'm doing a Z calculation, here's what it looks like. It would be sample mean minus the claimed mean sigma divided by root n. So you see it, sigma divided by root n. Let me actually kind of even highlight on that a little bit. So there's what the T, that's what the, sorry, the Z calculation would look like. Let's talk about the T calculation. It would be sample mean minus claimed mean divided by standard deviation of the square root of n. So look at that, again, tiny, tiny, subtle difference. T, use the sample standard deviation. Z, use the population standard deviation. And then we do know that the only other difference here is that means a, a T also gets this little defining factor called degree of freedom, N minus 1. And that would tell us exactly how much proportion or the, my, what my p-value would end up being based on the degree of freedom. Degree of freedom is important in calculating that. Now your calculator does it behind the scenes and we'll be okay with letting the calculator do most of the work for us there. Okay, so that would be it. So then let's talk about what do I do in my calculator? If I'm doing this, I'm gonna run literally a thing called z-test in my calculator and that's gonna get me this value. I can let it calculate that for me. Or if I'm running a t-test, there's literally a function just called t-test. It would calculate that for me. It would calculate that for me. And those also obtain the different p-values for you. So the O, you'd get a p-value. Here, if I was doing O, I'd get a p-value. And yes, the z-test calculates the p-value for you for both of those. The t-test calculates the p-value for you for that one. So that's kind of the, the big pieces of it right there. And I'm going to tell you, for the my open math stuff, really know the calculator stuff. The calculator stuff will really get you to where we need to go with this stuff, right? T-test, z-test, or up here, I'm doing a one-prop z-test. All right, so that's the kind of the differences there. And then, instead of me writing the M and the S value again, just remember that it is the same all the way through. So here's what it would be again. P-value versus alpha value. Once you've made your decision, summarize accordingly with the right um, values there. Okay, so... Let me just kind of look at this all as one big giant group for a minute. Chapter nine is built on this foundation right here. So again, first thing that you're gonna do, read, is this thing a proportions, is it a means? If it's a means, you gotta go one further step. Is it a Z or a T? If you're not sure, it's probably a T. It's probably gonna be a T most of the time that you ever do these things. Um, and then you go through that and then just go through your phantoms. This is your phantoms, right? This is your phantoms workout. Um, if you look at chapter eight, you can have your panic, and it should kind of look kind of the same. There's a structure to it. The A part of panic, the A part of phantoms is the same in chapter eight and chapter nine. We have not changed those. Okay, so just know that. All right, let me also look one last little uh, piece here when we're talking about means T. Sometimes, remember we have this thing called matched pairs data. What happened when we get match pairs data? It is a t-test. It's a means t-test when you do a match pairs data, but there's a couple things that we said, hey, remember these things. This was last class. Uh, that was yesterday, last class. Uh, match pairs data. First thing that I will remind you is only care about the difference data, right? So if they give us a set like a pre-test score and a post-test score, I don't care about pre-test, I don't care about post-test, I care about the difference. That's all I care about. So I only want that data set, the difference data set. So you only care about the difference data set. Um, match pairs data um, will always have 
a standard null hypothesis. It will always have a standard null hypothesis. Because we're only looking at the difference data, our standard null hypothesis will be that the average difference is equal to zero. This is always a standard null hypothesis. So use it. You don't even have to, you're like, hey, this is a matched pairs data set. Guess what? Null hypothesis is, is uh, the difference, the average difference is zero. Write it down, figure out what the alternative is, move on. All right, so that's what you'd end up doing there for that. So that's really the only difference for the matched pairs data set. Everything else, keep constructing it just like you would a normal T means thing. These are just the only little caveats to it right here. You'll see one of these today in your, in your data set problem. You'll see a match pairs data set. So I want you to look at the difference column only, and I want you to work it from there. All right? So one last thing then is this thing called, remember we got a thing called type one error, and we have a type two error. I want you to know those two errors. Be able to kind of formally talk about what is a type one error in context, what is a type two error in context. So what is a type one error? Remember it is when we reject the null hypothesis, but find out the null hypothesis is actually true, right? Because that would be an error if you rejected something that was true. Type two error, just the opposite. When we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but find out the null hypothesis is actually false. All right, so type one, you can, and sometimes I'll say, based on your problem, like maybe in your decision, you're like, hey, we reject the null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, then you possibly made a type one error. You don't know if you made one right at the beginning, you, you'd have to wait and see, right? And this is how tests are done right now. Like they are doing this exact testing right now on like COVID vaccines and things like that, right? We're doing this constant testing. We could be making an error, right? If we are rejecting claims, making possible errors, we won't know until the future dates. And then we're like, oh, that was an error, right? So if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we are possibly making a type two error. Here. And so the only other thing I'll tag on here, and then we, we stay with the type 1 error, probability of a type 1 error is equal to your alpha level. So at least this is something you can always hang on to. So if type 1 error is a bad error to make, use a small alpha value. <laughs> if we don't want to make a type 1 error, use a small alpha. If a type one error is, a, is an okay error to make, use a bigger alpha value. It's okay to make it, so use a bigger alpha value. And then I'm not gonna show you calculation for type two error just because it's really complex and we don't really focus on it too much. We really just kind of stay with the type one error here. Okay, so that is really kind of the, the big rundown on what it is that you're doing in the